Uh, thank you all. I, I have to say it's, it's really been a, a tremendous privilege to be uh, part of the Norton Neuroscience Institute, uh, and I'm really thrilled to be part of this uh, uh, symposium today. So my topic is going to be the evaluation and diagnosis of dementia. Uh, as we're working this out, I'll, I'll go ahead and say that I don't have any disclosures for this talk. Is a bit of an outline of this talk. Uh, I'm going to start with uh, discussing the spectrum of cognition uh, and aging. We can go ahead and advance to the third slide if you'd like. Um, so I'll give some general background talking about cognition and, and aging generally, uh, really looking at that spectrum from normal to abnormal. And then I'll discuss some of the major causes of cognitive impairment or dementia, really focusing on those over the age of 65. And, and then we'll move into an evaluation of individuals with a suspected dementia. Uh, so we can go ahead and next slide, please. So, uh, and then we can go one more slide, thank you. Uh, so as background, we often think of cognition on a spectrum uh, and there's a wide range of normal and this becomes even wider with age. Uh, so we often think of one end as successful aging. In other words, absolutely no change cognitively uh, with age. At the age of 80, my cognition is the same as it was when I was 30. And then there's usual aging. And in usual aging, we do see some fairly minor, often subtle cognitive changes with age. Uh, sometimes we refer to this as changes in our fluid intelligence. So my learning of new items may, may not be quite as efficient. It may take me a little longer to recall items. My uh, problem solving may be a little bit slower. At the same time, crystallized intelligence, so items that we have already learned, should stay intact. And there's some thought that uh, wisdom uh, and judgment can even improve with age. And then finally, we have cognitively impaired aging. And that's where we get into uh, conditions such as mild cognitive impairment or dementia. Uh, so next slide, please. Uh, and this is a graphical representation of this. So if we look at kind of that spectrum of cognition uh, on the x-axis and cognitive function on the y-axis, at the far end, we have successful aging. So again, this is aging where there's absolutely no change in cognition at all. And then next over from there, we'll see age-associated memory impairment. And that might be uh, another way of saying usual aging. So we have some very mild or subtle changes in memory. And then we can move into mild cognitive impairment. So this is a condition where we'll have some clear decline beyond what's normal in at least one sphere of cognition. That may be memory, it may be language, it may be executive function, but it's not to the degree that it's really impairing significantly our, our daily activities. And then finally, we can move into dementia. And this is a condition where we'll see impairments in multiple spheres of cognition, now to the degree where we really do have some impairment in our day-to-day -day activities. So next slide, please. So let's look at mild cognitive impairment a little more carefully. And as I mentioned, this is a condition where we'll have some measurable uh, decline in cognition. Often that may be memory. Uh, but again, it's not to the degree where we have clear cut impairments of our activities of daily living. An estimated prevalence would be 10 to 20% over the age of 65. And the most recent number I saw put it between 16 and 17%. We often quote a risk of conversion to dementia at about 10 to 12% per year. Again, a recent number I saw put that at just under 15% over a two year period. But this third point's important. As many as 14 to 55%, depending on what study you read, will revert to normal cognition. And I realize that's a fairly wide range, but the point there is, some significant number of individuals with mild cognitive impairment will revert to normal cognition. Some will revert to dementia and some won't change at all. And, and for that reason, MCI is often considered an unstable diagnosis. It's speculated that the reason for that is that there is not a single cause for MCI. So in some cases, it may be due to a degenerative condition like Alzheimer's disease. And in that case, we'd expect it to progress to a frank dementia. But in other cases, it may be related to other factors like medications, other medical or metabolic uh, 
disturbances, even stress, uh, depression. So there may be a number of causes that can lead us to myocognitive impairment. So next slide, please. And this is another just graphical representation of that. So if you look on the left-hand side, we may start out with normal aging. We may progress to mild cognitive impairment. Once at mild cognitive impairment, we may stay there. We may revert back to normal aging or we may progress on to dementia. So next slide, please. So that takes us to dementia. And think of dementia really as a broad umbrella term. And it very simply refers to a condition where we have impairments in multiple spheres of cognition. So again, language, uh, memory, uh, executive function, and so on. And it is to a degree that it significantly impairs our day-to-day -day functioning. Alzheimer's disease, as an example, is the most common form of dementia uh, with probably 60 to 80% of all cases of dementia being related to Alzheimer's disease. Uh, that equates to just over 6 million in the United States alone, and somewhere over 11% of those aged uh, greater than 65 in the U.S. likely have Alzheimer's disease. So next slide, please. So let's talk about some of the major causes of dementia. Thank you. Uh, and, and this is a very high-level overview, and then we'll go into each in a little bit more detail as we go along. So again, the, the most common cause of dementia is Alzheimer's disease. That's marked most notably by impairments in memory. Uh, next, we have vascular dementia, or sometimes thought of as vascular cognitive impairment. Obviously, that's associated with cerebrovascular disease. Uh, and often we see kind of a disexecutive syndrome, uh, more difficulty planning, uh, managing affairs. We'll often see more of a slowed cognition with that. And then there's dementia with Lewy bodies. That's often marked by a Parkinsonism, uh, fluctuations in cognition, uh, and hallucinations, particularly visual hallucinations. And then finally, frontotemporal dementia. Uh, and that really is a category in and of itself with at least three main subcategories. And that can be marked by changes in personality or uh, language impairment. So next slide, please. So let's dig a little bit deeper into some of these individual causes. So again, Alzheimer's disease, the most common form of dementia, up to 80% of all cases of dementia over the age of 65 are related to Alzheimer's disease. The course is typically insidiously progressive over about eight to 10 years. Uh, we always ask when symptoms began, but in truth, it can be very difficult to precisely say when these symptoms started. They just come on insidiously progressively over time. Initial symptoms, uh, difficulty recalling recent events, misplacing objects, repeating questions. And really that points to the, the initial issue with recent memory, or it might even be more accurate to say learning. We have trouble laying down those new memories. So I don't recall a recent event because I didn't form the memories related to that as effectively. I misplace objects because I don't recall where I put the object. I repeat questions because I don't remember that I already asked or I don't remember the answer. So it really is a problem with learning or recent memory. Now over time, we'll see additional symptoms. We may see disorientation and that can mean a couple of different things. If I am disoriented to date, I, I can't recall the month or the day of the week, well really that is probably an impairment of memory. <laughs> But if I have visual spatial disorientation, I have more trouble navigating from point A to point B, uh, that gets us into another sphere of cognition that we will commonly see in Alzheimer's disease, uh, language impairment. Early on, it is often difficulty with word finding. Now, we all have that tip of the tongue type phenomena. We can't quite come up with the word we want to say, and that can be perfectly normal. Uh, but that becomes more prominent in Alzheimer's disease. Then we may make paraphasia. So in a sense, these are near misses. And not to get too lost in the weeds, but I may make a semantic paraphasia where I can't come up with the word for chair, but I may substitute bench, something that's close. Or I may make a, a, a phonemic paraphasia. I just get a bit of the word wrong. So instead of chair, I might call it a gear. So I, I get part of the word, but don't quite have the whole thing. Then we may have disexecutive uh, difficulties. So again, problems planning, uh, problems managing. So I may have more trouble managing my medication or managing my finances, managing my home in general. 
And then we may see a social di disengagement. I may become just simply more withdrawn. Uh, if we could look under the microscope, what we would see are amyloid plaques uh, filled with a protein called beta amyloid and neurofibrillary tangles. So next slide, please. Uh, by many accounts, the second most common and most important, certainly, cause of dementia is vascular dementia. Uh, that accounts for probably 15 to 20 percent of all causes of dementia. It's often part of a mixed dementia. So, for instance, we often see it in association with Alzheimer's disease. Next slide, please. Uh, now, we can get to vascular cognitive impairment or vascular dementia in a couple of different ways. So we can have a strategic infarct. In this case, it's all about location. So for example, if I have a stroke affecting my thalamus, that may cause an amnesia, a memory disorder. It may cause an aphasia, a language syndrome or language disorder. If I have a stroke affecting my frontal lobes, it may affect my executive function. If it affects my temporal or parietal lobes, depending on the side, left or right, I may have an aphasia, language disorder, an apraxia, difficulty with certain skilled movements or activities. I may have a neglect syndrome or an agnosia where I actually learn the meet or lose the meaning of certain things. And then if it affects the hippocampus, an area that's often involved early on in Alzheimer's disease, it will again cause an amnesia or a problem with learning or memory. Now that can certainly happen, but it turns out these latter two points are probably more important. So we can have uh, what's sometimes referred to as a lacunar state. So in this case, it may have more to do with the quantity of strokes. So if I have more than four or small subcortical lacunar infarcts, that makes me more likely to have a dementia. Or what I personally think is even more important is this notion of subcortical atherosclerotic disease. Uh, and, and in that case, um, it's thought that it's that gradual slow accumulation of atherosclerosis that will over time impact blood flow, uh, oxygen delivery, nutrient delivery to the brain. And as a result, we can see a slowly progressive course. And in those terms, it may actually mimic Alzheimer's disease. But we can see some changes cognitively that help us separate out vascular dementia from Alzheimer's disease. We often <laughs> refer to this as a frontal subcortical circuit dysfunction. And, and with that, what we'll often see quite prominently is ex problems with executive function. Uh, for example, we may have difficulty uh, with planning, as I mentioned, or with managing affairs. We'll often see problems with attention, uh, working memory. Uh, my cognitive processing speed is slowed down. I can get to the right answer. It just is more difficult. It takes me longer to get there. Next slide, please. So just as we can see some of those cognitive changes, we are often going to see some physical changes. Uh, just as our cognitive speed is slowed, our physical speed may be slowed. So my walking speed is slower. My balance may be off. We'll often see changes in gait, sometimes referred to as a gait apraxia or a Parkinsonian gait. Some people will even use the term lower half Parkinsonism. It's almost as if I have Parkinson's disease from my waist down. We may also see problems with urinary control. And we may see some affective signs and symptoms. So for example, uh, depression or apathy. So next slide, please. And this is what we would see on an MRI scan. So this is a flare image. We're looking at it axially. So the top of the screen would be the front of the head. The bottom of the screen would be the back of the head. And what I want to draw your attention to are kind of these fluffy white areas uh, throughout the scan. Now, this is a little bit difficult. We can see some of those changes in up to 90% of us as we age. Uh, but there does seem to be some significant correlation between the amount of these changes and our risk for cognitive decline. And, and we do think that these uh, are an indication of subcortical vascular disease. So if someone has a vascular dementia, certainly this is a fairly high burden of white matter changes uh, that would support that diagnosis of a vascular cognitive impairment or vascular dementia. Oh, next slide, please. So now maybe number three on my list would be dementia with Lewy bodies. And some of the core features that we see, uh, 
a fluctuating cognitive impairment. Uh, and along with that, variations in attention and alertness. And I've seen this occur from really minute to minute, hour to hour, or day to day. But the point is that we see very significant fluctuations there. Uh, another core feature are recurrent visual hallucinations. And these are, again, typically visual and typically well-formed. Most commonly, people describe seeing animals or people, uh, maybe children in the home. We may see spontaneous motor features of Parkinsonism. In my experience, often that's more of a bradykinesia, slowness, a stiffness. And we may see a rim behavior disorder. So uh, in other words, a, a tendency to act out our dreams. Uh, and that may precede cognitive impairment uh, by some reports for years, if not decades. Now, we could make a diagnosis of probable uh, dementia with Lewy bodies with just a couple of these core features. Uh, I will point out while we don't often do these uh, very biomarker tests, a core feature plus an abnormality, for instance, on DAT scan or a, a sleep study, a polysomnogram showing loss of REM atonia would also certainly support a diagnosis of dementia with Lewy bodies. So, next slide, please. So some of the other supporting features, and I, I bolded the two that I think are most important. Repeated falls, that certainly would support a diagnosis of DLB. And syncope uh, or episodes of transient unresponsiveness, uh, certainly something we will see commonly with this condition. Now, some of the other features early on uh, was described a, a very great sensitivity to neuroleptics, particularly the older ones like Haldol. And, and certainly I've seen folks have a very severe reaction where they become markedly rigid, markedly Parkinsonian. Uh, fortunately, we don't always see that. Uh, system, systematized delusions, sometimes non-visual hallucinations uh, uh, can be auditory or even tactile. That's not the norm, but certainly we see that. Uh, hypersomnia, I, I think I would say I see commonly hyposmia, that loss of sense of smell, and then some other features like apathy, depression, or anxiety. So next slide, please. Uh, so this is something we might see on imaging. And this is actually showing some images uh, from an individual with Alzheimer's disease, an individual with dementia with Lewy bodies and NC and normal control. And on that top panel, we see a series of MRIs. These are coronal views. And inside that red rectangle, they're pointing out the hippocampus. Uh, if we start out on that far left side with Alzheimer's disease, what it's showing to us is very significant hippocampal atrophy. And that is something that would be a hallmark of Alzheimer's disease. On the DLB uh, section, we see some atrophy, but it's certainly not to the degree that we would see with Alzheimer's disease. And then you have the normal control on the right by comparison. But what I really want to point out is that bottom row, what we see with a DAT scan. So this is a scan that essentially is a way of measuring dopaminergic neurons within the striatum. And what you really want to see is this nice comma shape on either side. And you see that in the Alzheimer's disease brain and the normal control brain. But in the middle panel, the Lewy body brain, uh, you really just see a dot there. So what that is showing us is a significant decrease in dopaminergic neurons in the striatum. And that would be, in a sense, a biomarker supporting the diagnosis of Lewy body disease. Okay, next slide, please. So now uh, let's go to frontotemporal dementia or frontotemporal lobar degeneration. And I'll point out, I'm using these terms a, a bit loosely. Uh, many people will use frontotemporal lobar degeneration and frontotemporal dementia interchangeably. Uh, but some will argue that frontotemporal lobar degeneration is actually a pathological description of the underlying frontotemporal dementia. Again, I don't want to get too hung up on the details. But what do we see? Well, as I alluded to earlier, if we think of frontotemporal dementia, that really is a category with at least three major uh, conditions underneath of it. But broadly speaking, we may see behavioral or personality changes, disinhibition, emotional instability, lack of insight, judgment. We may see language dissolution. Uh, memory may be affected, but that's often later on in the disease. And we may occasionally see an associated Parkinsonism. So next slide, please. So if we look at these uh, individual conditions a little bit more carefully, uh, 
I think what most of us think about when we think of frontotemporal dementia is what's now referred to as the behavioral variant of FTD, behavioral variant frontotemporal dementia. And that is a condition where people have really marked changes in their personality. Uh, so someone who had previously been reserved, now it's as if they've lost, lost their filter. They're acting in uh, perhaps very rude or even lewd ways. They're very loud. Uh, they've lost their sense of empathy uh, for others. But I've also seen almost the opposite where someone has become markedly uh, apathetic, uh, happy to just sit and stare at the walls. But the point there is with behavioral variant FTD, we're really looking primarily at those personality or behavior changes. And then uh, there's a category of primary progressive aphasia. And there are two types I, I really want to point out here today. One is called the non-fluent or agrammatic PPA. Uh, some people will also refer to that as an apractic PPA. And, and the reason for that is with this condition, we have, it's an effortful speech. It's difficult to get the words out. It, it feels as if it's difficult for the individual to form those words. They'll often leave out some of the sort of grammatic connectors uh, there, we sometimes see dropping certain verbs in speech with that. Uh, and then there's semantic primary progressive aphasia, uh, which I think in my experience is less common. That's a condition where we lose the meaning of certain objects. So for example, if I show someone a pen, it's not just that they can't come up with the word for pen, they've lost the meaning for what that object is. They can't tell me uh, that you would use it to write with, for example. Now, there is another form of uh, PPA called logopenic PPA that is often related to Alzheimer's disease, and, and we're not going to talk about that further today. And then uh, there are some other conditions that we might consider in that frontotemporal dementia spectrum. Uh, so ALS, for example, can often be associated with a frontotemporal dementia. So we have FTD ALS. Uh, there are a couple of, sort of Parkinson's plus or Parkinsonian conditions that fall into this category as well, cortical basal syndrome and progressive supranuclear palsy, uh, which again, I won't go into further here today. So now let's turn to the evaluation of dementia. And like with most conditions, our goal during the evaluation is to make as accurate a diagnosis as possible, identify any reversible causes, certainly in the case of dementia, and then really help our, uh, our further treatment. And so that really falls into three main areas for evaluation, uh, history, neurologic examination, and then ancillary testing. So next slide, please. And like with many conditions, if not most conditions in neurology, uh, we really get most of our work done in the history. Uh, I would say 90 to 95% of the time, we have a pretty good preliminary diagnosis at the end of that history. And these are some of the elements that are really critical. Now, first of all, I'll point out that we often need a history from an informant. And, and this may seem a little silly to say, but if I have someone coming into my office by themselves and they tell me that they're really concerned they have Alzheimer's disease, they probably don't. But if someone comes into my office and says, I think I'm doing fine, but my family is concerned, that's when I'm most concerned. Uh, the individual with the condition often doesn't have that insight themselves, so we need an informant. And what we really need to find out is a few elements. The onset. Was it acute? Was it subacute? Or most commonly, it's going to be insidious. It's just going to be gradually progressive over years, really. We want to know what was the initial symptom. Was the initial symptom a problem with that recent or short-term memory? Was it a problem with language? Was it something else? And then we want to get an idea of the course. Is it progressive? Is it fluctuating or is it static? Other important elements, past medical history, in particular, getting an idea about certain vascular risk factors like hypertension, diabetes, uh, heart disease. We certainly want to review current medications. We want to get an idea about family history. While these conditions often aren't uh, inherited in an autosomal dominant fashion, for instance, we can often get important clues from that family history. And then we like to know a little bit about the social history, in particular things like educational history, uh, history of substance abuse or other high risk behaviors. So next slide, please. Uh, on the physical or neurological exam, uh, 
I'll point out first uh, that with Alzheimer's disease, the exam is often completely normal and can be fairly brief. But there are clues that we might get that would point us in a direction other than Alzheimer's disease. So for example, if we see pyramidal signs, weakness or spasticity, that may lead us to look at vascular disease. If we see extra pyramidal signs like bradykinesia uh, uh, or hypertonicity, that might point us more towards a Parkinsonian disorder and so forth. Um, next slide, please. Uh, and then we want to do at least some type of uh, mental status testing. And this is often part of a standardized exam, like the mini mental state exam or the Montreal Cognitive Assessment. But it's good conceptually to think of some key areas or spheres of cognition. So first of all, we want to get some, uh, uh, some idea about attention. If our patient really can't focus or attend, and we may get a lot of that just through the initial interview or exam, if they don't have normal attention, that's going to impair everything else that we see on their mental status exam. Uh, next, we might think about language. We want to get some idea about their ability to produce language. We may look at naming. We may look at repetition. We certainly also want to understand comprehension. So that may involve uh, following single or multi-step commands. We want to understand if language is intact because much of our testing of memory is going to be related to language. So we need to know that's intact in order to look at memory. In terms of memory, and, and I often lump orientation into this because when we think of orientation, we're often asking things like date or year, which are in fact tests of memory. Uh, but we need some measurement of that. And then we want to look at visual spatial function. So next slide, please. And then we think about uh, ancillary testing. And believe it or not, based on most recent guidelines, that can be fairly brief or simple. Now, we're talking about someone over the age of 65 that has a fairly typical, gradually progressive uh, history consistent with dementia. In those cases, the testing can be relatively simple. It can be as short as a B12 level, a TSH, and brain imaging. Uh, CT or MRI, I'll show you for various reasons, MRI is preferred. Now, older recommendations, and I think still most of us would recommend doing some other at least minimum blood uh, work, like a blood count, a metabolic profile. We'll often add a, a methylmalonic acid level. The reason for that, that really helps increase our sensitivity looking for a B12 deficiency. Uh, we'll often look at folate, which uh, folate deficiency can very much mimic a B12 deficiency. And then in selected cases, uh, we may want to do uh, syphilis serologies. So next slide, please. So why do we do imaging? Uh, well, the simple answer would be we're looking for evidence of tumor or vascular disease. And this is an MRI uh, showing us a, uh, a meningioma. And I would say probably a couple times a year, I will see someone that has a meningioma. It isn't always midline, but impacting our frontal lobes in such a way that we may not have other symptoms beyond a gradually progressive cognitive decline. And if we see and recognize this, at the very least, we can halt that decline and in some cases reverse it. So that's important not to miss. Now, next slide, please. I know I just said that typically what we're looking for are evidence of tumor, vascular disease, uh, things like that. But in some cases, we can see patterns of atrophy that will point us to a particular direct, in a particular direction. And if you look at the panel on your right, it, it is really fairly self-evident. Just simply compare the appearance of the front of the brain on the left of the back of the brain on the right hand side. And you can see a fairly marked atrophy uh, frontally on this sagittal view, uh, which would be very strongly suggestive. It doesn't prove it, but very strongly suggestive of a frontotemporal dementia. And, and I'll say as an aside, uh, it is often a frontotemporal dementia where we're most likely to see some of these patterns of atrophy on an MRI. So next slide, please. Uh, this next one is probably not the best way to demonstrate uh, hippocampal size, but I think it illustrates a point, and that's why I've saved this slide. Uh, these are uh, 
axial views of the brain and the hippocampus or hippoc parahippocampal region has been colored in in red. And I want you to see this progression across from left to right. At the age of 25 years, we have nice large hippocampi. At the age of 75, the hippocampi are smaller, but that's still normal. They're still functioning perfectly well. As we progress to MCI, mild cognitive impairment, that might get smaller. As we progress to Alzheimer's disease, that gets smaller yet. And if you saw this MRI on the right, it would not prove that someone has Alzheimer's disease, but it would certainly alert you to that possibility. Now, I don't have an example of this, but in the near future, we're going to uh, be able to do MRIs that really measure that cortical thickness and atrophy patterns uh, in a much more sophisticated way. And I think that'll help with our uh, diagnostic acumen. Next slide, please. So this is just one other example of, of something we would see on an MRI, particularly if we run the right sequences that we might not see on other imaging. This is a, a gradient echo sequence. You would see the same thing on a susceptibility weighted uh, image. And what I want to point you to are these little black dots. You can see them more on the left or the right hemisphere, but you can see them throughout. This particular uh, sequence shows hem hemosiderin deposition. And really what that is saying is that we're picking up microhemorrhages throughout the brain. In the proper clinical context, and certainly with this number of microhemorrhages, that points us to a diagnosis of cerebral angio, uh, amyloid angiopathy. That's often associated with Alzheimer's disease, but not necessarily synonymous with Alzheimer's disease. So another example of how an MRI can really help us with an accurate diagnosis. The next slide, please. Um, now, what I showed you was a, a typical evaluation we would do in a typical patient, someone over the age of 65 with a course fairly typical of a progressive neurodegenerative dementia. But there are certain red flags that may point us to do a more detailed uh, investigation or at least consider some other possibilities. So what are those? Uh, the most important, oh, I'm sorry, go back one slide, please. Uh, the, the most important two that I, I think I, I want to talk about today are rapidly progressive dementia. Uh, and that's an arbitrary definition, rapid progression, but we might say from onset to severe dementia or death in less than two years. Uh, so rapid progression and young onset certainly change the, di uh, change the evaluation we would do. Other things to consider though, prominent fluctuations, high risk exposure behaviors, Unexplained or unanticipated findings on the exam should be followed up on. And then uh, testing, neurocognitive testing that's incongruent with the history would point us to think of some other, other potential etiologies. So the next slide now, please. Uh, so if someone has an early onset or a rapidly progressive dementia, certainly we want to expand our battery of testing. And we will often do this in two phases. So the first phase, obviously there's a lot of overlap with what we would do in the routine evaluation, but we do a few additional things. Certainly we would do syphilis or HIV serology. We'd look at ammonia level. We'll check an EEG. And in those cases, uh, we really would want to uh, consider neuropsychological testing. Uh, so next, next slide, please. Uh, some of the things we might see on an MRI, uh, this is a little subtle before you clue into it, but I would point you on the right hemisphere, the anterior temporal lobe. There's a little bit of bright signal there that would indicate a limbic encephalitis, and that may be an infectious or autoimmune condition. So next slide, please. This is a diffusion weighted imaging, and we usually think of that as a measure or a way to look at stroke. But in this case, you see a very bright signal around the cortex, frontally and the insula and posteriorly, particularly on the right. Um, and that is a very strong indication of underlying uh, CJD or prion disease. Next slide, please. Now, if we've gone through our initial testing and that's been normal, uh, then we'll go into our next uh, round of testing. And that include, can include inflammatory markers, looking at thyroid antibodies, uh, heavy metals, and then in the right case, uh, autoimmune encephalitis antibodies. And these can be done both uh, in serum and CSF, and I, I usually will do them in both. 
and then we'll do a spinal fluid exam. So next slide, please. Uh, in the spinal fluid exam, we don't need a lot of studies. We'll certainly need cell count, protein, glucose. We'll also want to look at oligoclonal bands. That's a way of looking at uh, sort of an immune response or inflammation within the nervous system that might point us to an autoimmune encephalitis. And then RT quick, that's a, uh, really a very good study looking at prions if CJD or prion disease is expected. Next slide. And I know we're a little short on time, so I'll go through these last slides a little bit quickly. What do we think about if we see prominent fluctuations? Well, certainly we think of DLB, dementia with Lewy bodies. We think about a toxic metabolic disturbance. We may think of a sleep disorder. We may think of a psychiatric illness. Uh, now rare, but we may also think of an epileptic amnesia. And in that case, we may want to do prolonged EEG monitoring, not just a routine 20 minute, but maybe an hour long EEG. Next slide, please. And then if there are certain high risk exposures or behaviors, uh, we want to pay attention to that. That may be medications, it may be alcohol, uh, or if we see someone that has uh, behaviors like multiple sexual partners or IV drug abuse, we uh, will in particular want to look for syphilis, HIV, or if immune compromised, we may think of other conditions like a cryptococcal meningitis or a JC virus, uh, uh, PML. Next slide, please. And then uh, I think I'm near the end uh, on if we have incongruent cognitive testing. So when someone comes in and describes really very great disability, but we're just not seeing it on their cognitive testing, then we may think of things like mood disorders, sleep disorders, uh, medication, substance abuse, or even sensory impairment like hearing loss. Now I should point out behavioral variant FTD may present in this way too. Our tests aren't really that great at looking for it. So we would consider that as well. So last, uh, next slide, please. Uh, and this is really my last slide, just to summarize things. So how, what is our evaluation? Well, the most important thing is the history. We want to establish the onset, course, initial symptoms, and we really need an informant to help us with that. The exam's typically going to be normal in Alzheimer's disease. We need some objective measure of cognition, and that can be as simple as a routine uh, test like the MMSC or MOCA. And then uh, I listed what is, I think, the minimum uh, ancillary workup. Uh, but we want to watch for red flags. And if we see uh, someone with a rapidly progressing or on early onset dementia, we want to think of some additional testing that includes blood work, spinal fluid, and EEG. Uh, next slide. Uh, and that is telling me that I have come to the end of uh, my talk there. Uh, so thank you all very much.